The Song of Hiawatha is an 1855 epic poem, in Trachaic Tetrameter, by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, featuring a Native American hero. Longfellow sources for the legends and ethnography found in his poem were the Ojibwe chief Kaht Gar Gar Bowh during their visits at Longfellow's home. Black Hawk and other Sac and Fox Indians Longfellow encountered on Boston Common. Algic researches and additional writings by Henry Rose Schoolcraft, an ethnographer and United States Indian agent. And Heckwelder's narratives. In sentiment, scope, overall conception, and many particulars, Longfellow's poem is a work of American Romantic literature, not a representation of Native American oral tradition. Longfellow insisted, I can give chapter and verse for these legends. Their chief value is that they are Indian legends. Longfellow had originally planned on following Schoolcraft in calling his hero Manabatsu, the name in use at the time among the Ojibwe of the south shore of Lake Superior for a figure of their folklore a trickster transformer. But in his journal entry for June 28, 1854, he wrote, Work at Manabatsu. Or, as I think I shall call it, Hiawatha Euro that being another name for the same personage. Hiawatha was not another name for the same personage, but a probable historical figure associated with the founding of the League of the Iroquois, the five nations then located in present-day New York and Pennsylvania. Because of the poem, However, Hiawatha became the namesake for towns, schools, trains and a telephone company in the western Great Lakes region, where no Iroquois nations historically resided. Publication and Plot The poem was published on November 10, 1855, and was an immediate success. In 1857, Longfellow calculated that it had sold 50,000 copies. Longfellow chose to set the Song of Hiawatha at the Pictured Rocks, one of the locations along the south shore of Lake Superior favored by narrators of the Manabatsu stories. The song presents a legend of Hiawatha and his lover Minahaha in 22 chapters. Hiawatha is not introduced until Chapter 3. In Chapter 1, Hiawatha's arrival is prophesied by a mighty peace-bringing leader named Jich Manito. Chapter 2 tells a legend of how the warrior Mjkiwis became father of the Four Winds by slaying the great bear of the mountains, Mishmokwa. His son Waban, the East Wind, falls in love with a maiden whom he turns into the morning star, Waban Anung. Waban's brother, Kababonoka, the North Wind, bringer of autumn and winter, attacks Shinjbees, the diver. Shinjbees repels him by burning firewood, and then in a wrestling match. A third brother, Sherwandasi, the South Wind, falls in love with a dandelion, mistaking it for a golden-haired maiden. In Chapter 3, in Unremembered Ages, a woman named Nokomis falls from the moon. Nokomis gives birth to Wenonna, who grows to be a beautiful young woman. Nokomis warns her not to be seduced by the West Wind but she does not eat her mother, becomes pregnant and bears Hiawatha. In the ensuing chapters, Hiawatha has childhood adventures, falls in love with Minahaha, slays the evil magician Pearl Feather, invents written language, discovers corn and other episodes. Minahaha dies in a severe winter. The poem closes with the approach of a birch canoe to Hiawatha's village, containing the priest of prayer, the pale face. Hiawatha welcomes him joyously. And the black robe chief brings word of Jesus Christ. Hiawatha and the chiefs accept the Christian message. Hiawatha bids farewell to Nokomis, the warriors, and the young men, giving them this charge, but my guests I leave behind me slash listen to their words of wisdom, slash listen to the truth they tell you. Having endorsed the Christian missionaries, he launches his canoe for the last time westward towards the sunset and departs forever. The story of Hiawatha was dramatized by tale spinners for children with Jordan milk. Folkloric and ethnographic critiques, general remarks, much of the scholarship on the Song of Hiawatha in the 20th century, dating to the 1920s, has concentrated on its lack of fidelity to Ojibwe ethnography and literary genre rather than the poem as a literary work in its own right. In addition to Longfellow Euro unregistered trademark S own annotations, Stellanova Osborne tracked down chapter and verse for every detail Longfellow took from Schoolcraft. Others have identified words from native languages included in the poem. 
Schoolcraft as a text maker seems to have been inconsistent in his pursuit of authenticity, as he justified rewriting and censoring sources. The folklorist Death Thompson, although crediting Schoolcraft's research with being a landmark, was quite critical of him. Unfortunately, the scientific value of his work is marred by the manner in which he has reshaped the stories to fit his own literary taste. Intentionally epic in scope, the Song of Hiawatha was described by its author as this Indian Edda. But Thompson judged that despite Longfellow's claimed chapter and verse citations, the work produce, s, a unity the original will not warrant, that is, it is non-Indian in its totality. Thompson found close parallels in plot between the poem and its sources, with the major exception that Longfellow took legends told about multiple characters and substituted the character Hiawatha as the protagonist of them all. Resemblances between the original stories, as reshaped by Schoolcraft, and the episodes in the poem are but superficial, and Longfellow omits important details essential to Ojibwe narrative construction, characterization, and theme. This is the case even with Hiawatha Euro unregistered trademark S. Fishing, the episode closest to its source. Of course, some important parts of the poem were more or less Longfellow Euro unregistered trademark S. Invention from fragments or his imagination. The courtship of Hiawatha and Minnehaha, the least a Euro Indiana Euro unregistered trademark of any of the events in a Euro Hiawatha. A Euro unregistered trademark has come for many readers to stand as the typical American Indian tale. Also, in exercising the function of selecting incidents to make an artistic production, Longfellow omitted all that aspect of the Manabatsu saga which considers the culture hero as a trickster, this despite the fact that Schoolcraft had already diligently avoided what he himself called vulgarisms. In his book on the development of the image of the Indian in American thought and literature, Pierce wrote about the Song of Hiawatha, it was Longfellow who fully realized for mid-nineteenth century Americans the possibility of, the image of the noble savage. He had available to him not only, previous examples of poems on the Indian but also the general feeling that the Indian belonged nowhere in American life but in dim prehistory. He saw how the mass of Indian legends which Schoolcraft was collecting depicted noble savages out of time, and offered, if treated right, a kind of primitive example of that very progress which had done them in. Thus in Hiawatha he was able, matching legend with a sentimental view of a past far enough away in time to be safe and near enough in space to be appealing, fully to image the Indian as noble savage. For by the time Longfellow wrote Hiawatha, the Indian as a direct opponent of civilization was dead, yet was still heavy on American consciences. The tone of the legend and ballad a Euro would color the noble savage so as to make him blend in with a dim and satisfying past about which readers could have dim and satisfying feelings. Historical Iroquois Hiawatha There is virtually no connection, apart from name, between Longfellow's hero and the 16th century Iroquois chief Hiawatha who co-founded the Iroquois League. Longfellow took the name from works by Schoolcraft, which he acknowledged as his main sources. In his notes to the poem, Longfellow cites Schoolcraft as a source for a tradition prevalent among the North American Indians, of a personage of miraculous birth, who was sent among them to clear their rivers, forests, and fishing grounds, and to teach them the arts of peace. He was known among different tribes by the several names of Michaba, Shiabo, Mainabozo, Taraniwagan, and Hiawatha. Longfellow's notes make no reference to the Iroquois or the Iroquois League or to any historical personage. However, according to ethnographer Horatio Hale, there was a long-standing confusion between the Iroquois leader Hiawatha and the Iroquois deity Aronioagan because of an accidental similarity in the Anondaga dialect between their names. The deity, he says, was variously known as Aronioagan, Terenhyernagan, Ainiawaji, or Teiawaji. The historical Iroquois leader, as Hiawatha, Tainwatha or Thanaj. Schoolcraft made confusion worse. By transferring the hero to a distant region and identifying him with Minabatsu, a fantastic divinity of the Ojibwe's. Schoolcraft's book has not in it a single fact or fiction relating either to Hiawatha himself or to the Iroquois deity Aronioagan. In 1856, Schoolcraft published The Myth of Hiawatha and Other Oral Legends Mythologic and Allegoric of the North American Indians, 
reprinting stories previously published in his Algic researches and other works. Schoolcraft dedicated the book to Longfellow, whose work he praised highly. The U.S. Forest Service has said that both the historical and poetic figures are the sources of the name for the Hiawatha National Forest. Indian words recorded by Longfellow, Longfellow cites the Indian words he used as from the works by Henry Rose Schoolcraft. The majority of the words were Ojibwa, with a few from the Dakota, Cree and Onondaga languages. Though the majority of the Native American words included in the text accurately reflect pronunciation and definitions, some words seem to appear incomplete. For example, the Ojibwe words for blueberry are mean for the berries and Mianaga ones for the bush upon which the berries grow. Longfellow uses Mianahaga, which appears to be a partial form for the bush, but he uses the word to mean the berry. Critics believe such mistakes are likely attributable to schoolcraft or to what always happens when someone who does not understand the nuances of a language and its grammar tries to use select words out of context. Inspiration from the Finnish Kalevala, the Song of Hiawatha was written in Trachaic Tetrameter, the same meter as Kalevala, the Finnish epic compiled by Elias La Paragraph Nnrot from fragments of folk poetry. Longfellow had learned some of the Finnish language while spending a summer in Sweden in 1835. It is likely that, twenty years later, Longfellow had forgotten most of what he had learned of that language, and he referred to a German translation of the Kalevala by Franz Anton Schiffner. Trichy is a rhythm natural to the Finnish language Ia Euro and so far as all Finnish words are normally accented on the first syllable Ia Euro to the same extent that I am is natural to English. Longfellow Euro unregistered trademark s use of trachaic tetrameter for his poem has an artificiality that the Kalevala does not have in its own language. He was not the first American poet to use the trachaic in writing Indian romances. Schoolcraft had written a romantic poem, Alhalla, or the Lord of Taladega in trachaic tetrameter, about which he commented in his preface. The meter is thought to be not ill-adapted to the Indian mode of enunciation. Nothing is more characteristic of their harangues and public speeches, than the vehement yet broken and continued strain of utterance, which would be subject to the charge of monotony, were it not varied by the extraordinary compass in the stress of voice, broken by the repetition of high and low accent, and often terminated with an exclamatory vigor, which is sometimes startling. It is not the less in accordance with these traits that nearly every initial syllable of the measure chosen is under accent. This at least may be affirmed, that it imparts a movement to the narrative, which, at the same time that it obviates languor, favors that repetitious rhythm, or pseudo-parallelism, which so strongly marks their highly compound lexicography. Longfellow wrote to his friend Ferdinand Freiligrath about the latter's article, The Measure of Hiawatha in the prominent London magazine, Athenaeum, your article. Needs only one paragraph more to make it complete, and that is the statement that parallelism belongs to Indian poetry as well to finish a Euro and this is my justification for adapting it in Hiawatha. Trachaic is not a correct descriptor for Ojibwe oratory, song, or storytelling, but Schoolcraft was writing long before the study of Native American linguistics had come of age. Parallelism is an important part of Ojibwe language artistry. Cultural Response, Reception and Influence a short extract of 94 lines from the poem was and still is frequently anthologized under the title Hiawatha's Childhood. This short extract is the most familiar portion of the poem. It is this short extract that begins with the famous lines, By the shores of Jitgami, by the shining big sea water, stood the wigwam of Nokomis, daughter of the moon, Nokomis. Dark behind it rose the forest, rose the black and gloomy pine trees, rose the firs with cones upon them. Bright before it beat the water, beat the clear and sunny water, beat the shining big sea water. In August 1855, the New York Times carried an item on Longfellow's new poem, quoting an article from another periodical which said that it is very original, and has the simplicity and charm of a saga. It is the very antipodes, sick of Alfred Lord Tennyson's Maud, which is morbid, irreligious, and painful. In October of that year, the New York Times noted that Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha is nearly printed, and will soon appear. By November its column, Gossip, What Has Been Most Talked About During the Week, 
observed that the madness of the hour takes the metrical shape of trochees, everybody writes trochaics, talks trochaics, and think, sick in trochees. By the way, the rise in Erie, makes the bears as cross as thunder. Yes siree. And Jacob's losses, I've been told, are quite enormous. Parodies emerged instantly. The New York Times reviewed a parody of Hiawatha four days before reviewing Longfellow's Hiawatha. Pocahontas, or The Gentle Savage was a comic extravaganza which included extracts from an imaginary Viking poem, burlesquing the recent parodies, Good, Bad, and Indifferent, on the song of Hiawatha. The Times quoted, Whence this song of Pocahontas, with its flavor of tobacco, and the stinkweed, sick old mundungas, with the oco of the breakdown, with its smack of bourbon whiskey, with the twangle of the banjo, of the banjo euro the goat skinner, and the fiddlier euro the cat gutto. The New York Times review of the song of Hiawatha was scathing. The anonymous reviewer wrote the poem is entitled to commendation for embalming pleasantly enough the monstrous traditions of an uninteresting, and, one may almost say, a justly exterminated race. As a poem, it deserves no place, because there is no romance about the Indian. He complains that Hiawatha's deeds of magical strength pull by comparison to the feats of Hercules and to Finn Mac Cool, that big stupid Celtic mammoth. The reviewer writes that grotesque, absurd, and savage as the groundwork is, Mr. Longfellow has woven over it a profuse wreath of his own poetic elegances. But, he concludes, Hiawatha will never add to Mr. Longfellow's reputation as a poet. Thomas Conrad Porter, a professor at Franklin and Marshall College, believed that Longfellow had been inspired by more than the metrics of the Kalevala. He claimed the song of Hiawatha was plagiarism in the Washington National Intelligencer of November 27, 1855. Longfellow wrote to his friend Charles Sumner a few days later, as to having taken many of the most striking incidents of the Finnish epic and transferred them to the American Indians Euro it is absurd. Longfellow also insisted in his letter to Sumner that, I know the Kalevala very well, and that some of its legends resemble the Indian stories preserved by Schoolcraft is very true. But the idea of making me responsible for that is too ludicrous. Later scholars continued to debate the extent to which the Song of Hiawatha borrowed its themes, episodes, and outline from the Kalevala. Despite the critics, the poem was immediately popular with readers and continued so for many decades. The 1911 Encyclopaedia Britannica noted that the meter is monotonous and easily ridiculed, but it suits the subject, and the poem is very popular. Early modernist poets mocked it and, in the 20th century, the poem lost both esteem and popularity. The Grolier Club named the Song of Hiawatha the most influential book of 1855. Lydia Signy was inspired by the Song of Hiawatha to write a similar epic poem on Pocahontas, though she never completed it. Music, Longfellow's poem was taken as the first American epic to be composed of North American materials and free of European literary models. Earlier attempts to write a national epic, such as the Columbiad of Richard Snowden, a Euro a poem on the American war a Euro unregistered trademark published in 1795, or Joel Barlow's vision of Columbus, were considered derivative. Longfellow provided something entirely new, a vision of the continent's pre-European civilization in a meter adapted from a Finnish, non-Indo-European source. His work has inspired compositions by musicians since the 19th century. A musician who set his words said that the poem was an Edda that idealized the North American Indian and established an elevated type of man and prophet. Soon after the poem's publication, composers competed to set it to music. One of the first to tackle the poem was Emil Kast, whose cantata Hiawatha freely adapted and arranged texts of the poem. Arthur Foote set the poet's words in The Farewell of Hiawatha, dedicating it to the Apollo Club of Boston, the male voice group that gave its first performance. In 1897 Frederick Russell Burton completed his dramatic cantata Hiawatha, a Euro also based on Longfellow's words. At the same time he wrote Hiawatha's death song subtitled Song of the Ojibes, which set native words followed by an English translation by another writer. Longfellow's poem was the basis for a cantata trilogy, The Song of Hiawatha, 
by the African-English composer Samuel Coleridge Taylor. He named his son Hiawatha. The first part, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast, was particularly famous for well over 50 years, receiving thousands of performances in the UK, the USA, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa. It has slipped from popularity in recent years. It was followed by two additional oratorios, The Death of Minnehaha, and Hiawatha's Departure, which were almost equally popular. The Death of Minnehaha had a revival performance in Portland, Maine, in 2010. The first orchestral treatment was Robert's Chappell's Hiawatha, an Indian symphony. The composer consulted with Longfellow, who approved the work before its premiere in 1859. Another American treatment was Hugo Korn's symphonic poems Minnehaha and Hiawatha of 1901. Antorna End though unregistered trademark AK was familiar with the work in Czech translation. In an article published in the New York Herald on December 15, 1893, he stated that the second movement of his Symphony No. 9, From the New World, was a sketch or study for a later work either a cantata or opera which will be based upon Longfellow's Hiawatha and that the third movement scherzo was suggested by the scene at the feast in Hiawatha where the Indians dance. Though unregistered trademark AK said that the music of the Negroes and of the Indians was practically identical. Some passages that modern listeners associate with African American spirituals may have been intended by Dvoe unregistered trademark AK to evoke a Native American ambience. More popular settings of the poem followed publication of the poem. The first was Charles Crizat Converse's The Death of Minnehaha, published in Boston around 1856. The hand-colored lithograph on the cover of the printed song, by John Henry Bufford, is now much sought after. The next popular tune, originally titled Hiawatha, was not inspired by the poem. It was composed by a Euro Neil Marita Euro unregistered trademark while on a train to Hiawatha, Kansas, in 1901 and was inspired by the rhythm of the wheels on the rails. It was already popular when James Adair added lyrics in 1903 and the music was newly subtitled his song to Minaha. Later treated as a rag, it went on to become a jazz standard. Other popular songs have included Hiawatha Euro unregistered trademark S Melody of Love by George W. Mayer with words by Alfred Bryan and Artie Mellinger, and Al Bowley's Hiawatha Euro unregistered trademark S. Lullaby. Composers wrote works for young performers. They include the English musician Stanley Wilson's Hiawatha, 12 scenes for first grade solo piano, based on Longfellow's lines, and Sunni Newbold's Hiawatha for junior string orchestra, a rhythmic composition in Dorian mode. Some musicians have used excerpts from the poem. Mike Oldfield used the sections Hiawatha's Departure, and The Son of the Evening Star in the second part of his Incantations album. He rearranged some words to conform more to his music. Laurie Anderson used excerpts from the poem's third section at the beginning and end of the final piece of her Strange Angels album. Johnny Cash used a modified version of Hiawatha's Vision of Euro A as the opening piece on Johnny Cash Sings the Ballads of the True West. Artistic Use Artists also responded in number to the epic. The earliest pieces of sculpture were by Edmonia Lewis, who had most of her career in Rome. Her father was Haitian and her mother was Native American and African American. The arrow maker and his daughter, later called the Wooing of Hiawatha, was modeled in 1866 and carved in 1872. By that time she had achieved success with individual heads of Hiawatha and Minaha. Carved in Rome, these are now held by the Newark Museum in New Jersey. In 1872 Lewis carved the marriage of Hiawatha in marble, a work purchased in 2010 by the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. Other 19th century sculptors inspired by the epic were Augusta St. Gordon's. His marble statue of the seated Hiawatha is held by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jacob Elder created a bronze statue, Hiawatha carrying Minaha for the Columbian Exposition in 1893. It was installed in Minnehaha Park, Minneapolis, in 1912. In the 20th century, Marshall Fredericks executed a small bronze Hiawatha, now installed in the Michigan University Center. A limestone statue, also at the University of Michigan. And a relief installed at the Birmingham Covington School, B. 
Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. Early paintings were by artists who concentrated on authentic American native subjects. Eastman Johnson's pastel of Minnehaha seated by a stream was drawn directly from an Ojibwe model. The English artist Frances Ann Hopkins traveled in the hunting country of Canada and used her sketches from the trip when she returned to her studio in England in 1870. Her Minnehaha feeding birds was painted about 1880. Critics have thought these two artists had a sentimental approach, as did Charles of Permil Mile Hippolyte Lee Vinette in his 1871 painting of Minnehaha, making her a native child of the wild. The kinship of the latter is with other kitsch images, like Buffett's cover for the death of Minnehaha, or those of the 1920s calendar painters James Arthur and Rudolf F. Ingle. American landscape painters referred to the poem to add an epic dimension to their patriotic celebration of the wonders of the national landscape. Albert Bierstadt presented his sunset piece, The Departure of Hiawatha, to Longfellow in 1868 when the poet was in England to receive an honorary degree at the University of Cambridge. Other examples include Thomas Moran's Fiercely the Red Sun Descending, Burned His Way Along the Heavens, held by the North Carolina Museum of Art, and the panoramic waterfalls of Hiawatha and Minnehaha on their honeymoon by Jerome Thompson. Thomas Eakins made of his Hiawatha a visionary statement superimposed on the fading light of the sky. Toward the end of the 19th century, artists deliberately emphasized the epic qualities of the poem, as in William de Leftage Dodge's Death of Minnehaha. Frederick Remington demonstrated a similar quality in his series of 22 Grisselles painted in oil for the 1890 Deluxe Photogravure edition of the Song of Hiawatha. One of the editions is owned by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dora Wheeler's Minnehaha Listening to the Waterfall Design for a Needle Woven Tapestry made by the Associated Artists for the Cornelius Vanderbilt House, was also epic. Parodies, as noted above, parodies began to appear immediately the poem was published. Edward Wagenknecht has called it the most parodied poem in the English language. In 1856, a slim book entitled The Song of Milk and Water, translated from the original Fiji appeared, by Mark Anthony Henderson, and published by Tickell and Grin. It is a 94-page long parody of Hiawatha, following it chapter by chapter. It contains the following passage, in one hand peak week, the squirrel, in the other hand the blow guna euro, fearful instrument, the blow gun. And Ma Cosset and some pumpkin, kissed him, cause he killed the squirrel, cause it was a rather big one. From the squirrel skin, Ma Cosset, made some mittens for our hero, mittens with the fur side inside with the fur side next his fingers, so's to keep the hand warm inside. That was why she put the fur side a euro, why she put the fur side, inside. Over time, an elaborated version developed that was sometimes attributed to Strong and titled The Modern Hiawatha, when he killed them Jokivis, of the skin he made him mittens, made them with the fur side inside, made them with the skin side outside. He, to get the warm side inside, put the inside skin side outside. He, to get the cold side outside, put the warm side fur side inside. That's why he put the fur side inside, why he put the skin side outside, why he turned them inside outside. David W. Solomon set this passage as a canon for four equal voices. Lewis Carroll wrote Hiawatha's photographing, which he introduced by noting in an age of imitation. I can claim no special merit for this slight attempt at doing what is known to be so easy. Any fairly practiced writer, with the slightest ear for rhythm, could compose, for hours together, in the easy running meter of the Song of Hiawatha. Having then distinctly stated that I challenge no attention in the following little poem to its merely verbal jingle, I must beg the candid reader to confine his criticism to its treatment of the subject. A poem of some two hundred lines, it describes Hiawatha's attempts to photograph the members of a pretentious middle-class family ending in disaster. From his shoulder Hiawatha, took the camera of rosewood, made of sliding, folding rosewood. Neatly put it all together. In its case it lay compactly, folded into nearly nothing. But he opened out the hinges, till it looked all squares and oblongs, like a complicated figure, in the second book of Euclid. In 1865. James Linnan, a Scottish native and bookbinder in New York City, 
settled in California. He wrote about the Golden State, as in this excerpt from San Francisco, an entoke wooded Contra Costa, built on hills, stands San Francisco. Built on tall piles Oregonian, deeply sunk in mud terraqueous, where the crabs, fat and stupendous, once in all their glory reveled. And where other tribes testaceous, felt secure in Neptune's kingdom. Where sea sharks, with jaws terrific, fled from land sharks of the Orient. Not far from the Great Pacific, snug within the gate called Golden, by the hill called Telegraph, near the mission of Dolores, close by the valley of St. Anne's, San Francisco rears its mansions, rears its palaces and churches. Built of timber, bricks, and mortar, built on hills and built in valleys, built in Beelzebubian splendor, stands the city San Francisco. During World War I, Owen Rotter, a British officer of the Army of the Orient, wrote to Adlifer, to describe the city of Salonika, Greece, where several hundred thousand soldiers were stationed on the Macedonian front in 1916-1918. Tiadlifer thought of Kipling, wondered if he's ever been there, thought, at least in Ruegnatia, east and west are met together. There were trams and Turkish beggars, mosques and minarets and churches, Turkish baths in dirty kafar copyright s, picture palaces and can-cans, Dame Lacars and Leyland lorries, barging into buffalo wagons, French and English private soldiers, jostling seedy eastern brigands. Some Disney cartoons include episodes in which inept protagonists are beset by comic calamities on camping trips. Often these are introduced by a mock solemn intonation of the lines about the shores of Chichigami. The most famous of these was the 1937 silly symphony Little Hiawatha whose hero is a small boy whose pants keep falling down. The 1941 Warner Brothers cartoon, Hiawatha's Rabbit Hunt, featuring Bugs Bunny and a pint-sized version of Hiawatha, was nominated for an Academy Award. Margaret Pite wrote a parody skit based on Song of Hiawatha in 1958. It has been performed many times, most famously on Saturday Night Live. F.X. Reed wrote a computing-oriented parody, the Song of Hakawatha, containing references to hacking, Unix and compilers. Notes Bibliography, Calhoun, Charles C. Longfellow, A Rediscovered Life. Boston, Beacon Presser, Clements, William M. Schoolcraft as Text Maker, Journal of American Folklore 103, A 177-190. Irma, Christoph. Longfellow do. University of Illinois, Longfellow, Samuel, ed. Life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. With extracts from his journals and correspondence. Vol. 2. Boston, Tickner and Company, Moin, Ernest John. Hiawatha and Kalavala, a study of the relationship between Longfellow's Indian Edda and the Finnish epic. Folklore Fellows Communications 192. Helsinki. Swomen Shadi Katamia A. Nelson, Randy F. The Almanac of American Letters. Los Altos, California, William Kaufman, Incorporated A. New York Times. December 28, 1855. Longfellow's poem The Song of Hiawatha, Anonymous Review. Osborne, Chase S. Osborne, Stalanova. Schoolcraft A Euro Longfellow Euro Hiawatha Lancaster, Pennsylvania. The Jack Cattell Press, uh, Pierce, Roy Harvey. The Savages of America, The Study of the Indian and the Idea of Civilization. Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University Press, uh, Pisani, Michael Five Hiawatha, Longfellow, Roberts Chopel, and an early musical setting of Hiawatha, American Music, Spring 1998, 16, 1, A45 A Euro 85. Schoolcraft, Henry Rowe. Personal Memoirs of a Residence of Thirty Years with the Indian Tribes on the American Frontiers. Philadelphia, Lippincott, Grambo and Company, uh, Shrem, Wilbur. Hiawatha and its Predecessors, Philological Quarterly 11, A321 343. Singer, Elliot to Paul Bunyan and Hiawatha. In Dewhurst, C. Kurt. Lockwood, Yvonne, a Michigan Folklife Reader. East Lansing, Michigan State University Presser, Style, Mark. 
Pipestone State is Longfellow's Hiawatha. Minnesota Public Radio, July 22, 2005. Thompson, Stiff. The Indian Legend of Hiawatha, PMLA 37, 128 to 140. Thompson, Stiff, 1929. Tales of the North American Indians. Bloomington, Indiana University Presser, Williams, Mentoral, ed. 1956. Schoolcraft's Indian Legends. East Lansing, Michigan State University Presser, External Links, The Song of Hiawatha, Complete, at Project Gutenberg, http www.gutenberg.org 19, The Song of Hiawatha, Unabridged Audiobook, LibriVox, Rena M. Cohen, A Euro O. E. Longfellow, Hiawatha and Some Nineteenth Century Painters A Euro, Papers Presented at the Longfellow Commemorative Conference, April 1, A Euro 3, 1982, National Park Service, Longfellow National Historical Site.